lions were once found all over India, and their domains stretched throughout South and Central Asia. They were revered by Hindus and Buddhists as sacred, as the mount of the mother goddess Durga in Hinduism, the guardian of the gateway to a million temples, and the symbol of power of great Indian rulers like Ashoka. But over the centuries, attitudes towards the lion and towards wild India as a whole changed as new all-conquering cultures swept into the subcontinent. As a result, the great feline hunters became the hunted, fearless predator became prey, and the fate of the tiger and of the Asiatic lion was sealed. The 16th century saw the dawning of a new age in India with the arrival of the Mughals, the fierce and powerful Islamic dynasty from Central Asia who were to leave an indelible mark on the face of the country and build some of the most beautiful palaces the world has ever seen. Thundering into history from the steppe grasslands of Persia and Afghanistan, the Mughals were originally a warrior Mongol people, whose exploits were popular subjects for the Indian filmmakers of the 1920s, and who eventually conquered much of the subcontinent. The Mughals were Muslims, and unlike the mainly vegetarian Hindus, to whom all life was sacred, their religion permitted them to kill animals and eat meat. The Quran, the Islamic holy book, while teaching that nature should always be respected, also extols the virtues of the hunt, which, under the Mughals, became an organized sport. so-called Great Moguls, hunted on a huge scale, notably Akbar, who often embarked on a hunt, or shikar, with his army and combat elephants in tow. The activity then having the secondary benefit of providing military training. Hunting was therefore a substitute for war, both for those who took part and for the many subservient peoples it was designed to frighten. The form of shikar favored by Akbar was with cheetah, which was at the time common in the wild in India, and which took only a month or two to train. The favorite prey was the fleet-footed black buck. Akbar's hunts could last several months, and as many as 50,000 beaters might be used to drive thousands of terrified animals into the emperor's path. During one of these massacres, Akbar was said to have had a mystical experience, ordered the killing to stop and become a vegetarian thereafter. Ranthambore, in the western state of Rajasthan, was the site of a famous battle between the Mughals and the local Hindu kings, the Rajputs, and later became a royal hunting reserve. To the Mughals, the rich jungles of central India and the huge number of species to be found there were a great contrast to the dry, semi-desert grasslands from whence they came. 
Sambar, the largest Indian deer, often found grazing in the lakes of the reserve, would have been a prime prey for the hunters. But the greatest challenge to the courage of the Mughal hunting parties was presented by the great cat indigenous to this part of the world, the tiger. The tiger's arrival immediately puts the park's other inhabitants, even the jackals, on guard. Like many former hunting reserves of Indian princes, Ranthambore is now a nature reserve, famous for its tigers, which over the years have become noticeably less nocturnal than is natural in the wild. The usual number of cubs is two or three, and they tend to stay close to their mother for the first two years, by which time they're fully grown. Males live separately from females, and they only come together for mating purposes. So at this age, cubs are totally dependent on their mother for food, as the father will have returned to his solitary lifestyle. When they're fully grown, cubs sometimes hunt for a while in groups, or as a pair. Scratches on tree trunks, together with urine spraying, are used to mark territories. Tigers normally hunt at night and rest in the shade during the daytime. But here, unusually, they also hunt by day relying on the trees and long grass for cover. Depending on the size of its kill, the tiger will feed on it for four to five days, never moving far from the carcass during that time because of other predators. An average sized tiger might kill three deer every two weeks, or 80 a year, which means a base population of around 300 deer is needed to sustain a single adult tiger. Of all the creatures hunted by the moguls, the tiger, the so-called phantom of the forest, had a savage beauty and a special mystique, and symbolized to them, more than any other creature, India's wilderness. built some of the most magnificent palaces and monuments in the world, including the peerless Taj Mahal, commissioned by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan as a tribute to his wife, who is entombed within. A 
Around these palaces, they also created beautiful Persian-style paradise gardens. And within the design of the buildings, there are countless architectural details mirroring nature's forms. For them, the love of the beauty of nature and a passion for the thrill of the hunt were completely compatible. or certainly any of the kings uh, before the Mughal Empire in, in India uh, thought that there was a contradiction between a respect for nature and hunting as a sport. Um, it wasn't in that ethos or in the philosophy to con consider them as contradictory. Uh, the garden uh, full of flowering trees, uh, beautiful fragrances of flowers, running water, birds, butterflies. These are all things that were appreciated uh, for their symbolic value, for their sen the sensory pleasure that they provided. Uh, whereas sport and hunting for sport was an aspect of kingship and the two were not considered uh, contradictory, I don't think. Today, an army of artists recreate the world of the moguls for the tourist trade, painting in the style of the artists commissioned at the time to put on record the lifestyle of the great moguls and the exotic wildlife they found and studied. This school of art, and in particular the style of wildlife painting, was largely developed under the emperor Yahangir, a passionate naturalist himself but the great garden builder was the first of the great moguls, Babur, Yahangir's great-grandfather, who also made detailed scientific studies of the fascinating wildlife he discovered in India. Babur's sensitive, intelligent diary provides ample evidence of this and was beautifully illustrated with miniatures of birds and plants and with sketches of exotic animals. Elsewhere in his manuscript, Barbour describes the exquisite beauty he saw in a flock of birds as they landed and took off again, the light changing colour on their wings. He also lists accurately five types of Indian parrot including the ubiquitous rose-ringed parakeet. These are mobbing a tree snake that's intent on stealing their eggs. But one of the creatures that most fascinated the moguls, especially Babur, was an animal they also liked to hunt an ancient and mighty beast that has wandered these watery plains for millions of years. The greater one-horned or Indian rhinoceros, once common throughout the floodplains of the north of the subcontinent, is now only found in isolated pockets of riverine marshland. With its deeply folded thick skin, studded with rivet-like lumps on the shoulders and hind quarters, the Indian rhino appears to be armor-plated and stands over five feet tall. This makes it the second largest rhino species after the African white rhino. And this massive, solitary beast, weighing over two tons, has an appearance that is truly prehistoric. During the heat of the day, 
The only way to keep cool is to wallow in the ponds and mud pools of the plain. The rhino's diet is mainly grass, and the teeth and lips are designed for grazing and chewing the different kinds of grasses of the plain. The prehensile upper lip is used to gather in tall grasses and shrubs, and there are two long, sharp incisor teeth, which are used by males in battles for supremacy, instead of its large horn. During the hottest times of the year, rhinos will spend most of the daylight hours submerged in these ponds, with just their head and horn above water, oblivious to the other creatures around them. The horn, in fact, despite its fearsome appearance, is rarely used in aggression and is actually made of matted hair. It can be very long, giving rise to the suggestion that these beasts may have been the original unicorn of legend. They are generally solitary in habit, although they may occasionally be seen grazing or wallowing together. The Mughals hunted these creatures from elephant back, and they've been hunted mercilessly ever since. Today, there are less than 1,500 one-horned rhinos left, 400 or so in neighboring Nepal, and the rest here at Kaziranga in Assam, in the far northeast of India. The hunter's gun has been replaced by the tourist's camera, but there is still a very real threat from poaching. Rhino horn being in great demand in China, where it's believed to be an aphrodisiac, and 30 or 40 rhinos are killed here every year. Ironically though, the rhino, like the tiger, owes its survival in part to hunting, one of the main causes of its demise. For this park, like Rantambur, was originally set up as a game reserve. It was not the Mughals, though, who established this park as a hunting reserve, but the rulers who replaced them. And it was they who were to set in motion the biggest transformation yet of the riches of wild India. British who stepped into the power vacuum created by the decline of the Mughal Empire in the late 17th century. Trade was the main motivation for a strong British presence in Madras, Bombay and Calcutta, and the East India Company opened up the way for colonial rule. Railways and roads were built to open up the interior to exploitation, allowing natural resources like minerals and valuable hardwoods to be brought down to the coastal cities. Forests were also cleared to make way for commercial plantation agriculture, growing tea, coffee, spices and timber for the European market. And where possible, the traditional British way of life was recreated. Not only in terms of architecture, pleasure gardens and social conventions, but also through sport and other traditional British leisure pursuits. At the famous Uti Club, 
at the South Indian hill station of Utakamund, there's ample evidence of the popularity of one particular activity, hunting. The heads are not those of foxes, but jackals, hunted on horseback in the British style with full hunting pink. More common, though, was to hunt the wildlife of India with the gun, especially the biggest trophy of them all, the tiger. Oh, I think the, the British approach was that it should be a properly controlled, well-ordered sport. The attraction to me, I suppose, is something that is in you and I and everybody else. We are hunters, basically. And there was a thrill in it. But I very seldom shot deer. Well, I did shoot tiger and I do shoot panther. Um, and they were all done on foot. I used to go out with uh, two or three dogs and three of my men, and uh, it was uh, quite, quite something. I said, if you try and shoot a tiger by sitting up a tree on a bait, then you might just as well shoot the old cow you tied up. But there was no sport in that. The shooting of water birds was also popular with the British, and the most famous location was Bharatpur, near Delhi. Bharatpur is not a natural lake at all, but an artificial one created in 1896 by a keen hunter. Established expressly for the purpose of hunting, it was always kept well stocked with a huge variety of birds. The water level is controlled by a system of sluices and channels, the lake itself having been formed by the damming of a small stream. Only 11 square miles in size, this small lake has attracted kings, viceroys and princes like no other hunting reserve in India. They came here for the fashionable annual duck shoot, when massive slaughter took place. King Edward VIII once bagged over 2,000 birds here in a day. But the trophy boards bear witness to an even greater count, slaughtered by the viceroy and famous hunter, Lord Linlithgow. The astonishing record bag of 4,273 birds in a single day. autumn and winter months, the sheer numbers of birds visiting the reserve are astonishing. In October and November, every tree in the area is crammed full of nesting storks, herons and cormorants. chicks of the spoonbills and herons are by now quite large, but still totally dependent on their parents for food. All day long the adult birds swoop into the lake and return with food for their hungry chicks. These are painted storks, one of the largest and commonest birds in the reserve. In any one year, there may be as many as 5,000 pairs of painted storks breeding here, often nesting in colonies with other storks, sometimes of different species. By the water's edge, egrets and white storks mingle together, while snake birds, relatives of the cormorant, fish in their own unique way, in the style that gives them their name.
Once the young painted storks can fly and leave the nest, they're technically able to feed themselves. But many go on depending on their parents for food for several months. Safe from predators and man within the protected reserve, other species of animal also prosper here, like cheetah or spotted deer. It's also a haven for birds of prey, like tawny eagles, India's largest eagle, squabbling here over a dead stork. Today, Bharatpur, also called Keoladio Ghana, is justly heralded as one of the most important ornithological sites in the world. It was created, though, not by the British themselves, but by a local Maharaja. And it was his successor who, in 1945, turned this extraordinary place into one of India's most famous national parks. nature reserves are, in fact, the former hunting reserves of Maharajas. The Maharajas were Indian princes who ruled over princely states, some of them dating back to before the Mughals. They were famously rich and extravagant, and became even more so thanks to the patronage of the British, who used them as regional administrative allies and rewarded them by supporting them in their role as feudal landlords. A great many of them kept large nature reserves for the purpose of shikar and were ardent hunters, shooting almost anything that flew or ran. The scale of the killing was enormous. The Maharaja of Gwalior alone killed 1,400 tigers in his lifetime. But the Maharajas would claim that during their heyday, India was still teeming with wildlife and they were therefore doing little harm and perhaps even a service for the community. One thing in the olden days, when uh, there was plenty of game, there was a necessity at times to keep the level down, because if it is anything that is overpopulated or overgrown, or it's not good. It is a natural thing, because after all, as you know, even the olden days, in the prehistoric times, uh, the Homo sapiens, existed on hunting. And Lord Mountbatten joined the Maharaja in shooting duck, also the sand grass for which Bikanir is famous. One of the big events in the sporting year of the British Raj was the imperial sand grass shoot at Gajmir, hosted by the Maharaja of Bikanir, when it would be a poor day if there were not a bag of 4,000 birds. Certainly, the end of the morning saw the counting of a good bag, a very good bag indeed. Today, the shooting butts that overlook the carnage stand empty and unused, with no sign of the thousands of sand grouse that once came here. The Maharaja, like many of his contemporaries, has become an ardent conservationist, and the palace is now a calm, cool retreat from the heat and dust of the desert. When the dry season starts in earnest, sand grouse do still arrive from the desert to water here. But these days there are very few to be seen, decades of hunting having decimated their numbers.
another bird hunted almost to extinction, is the great Indian bustard, of which there are only a few hundred left in the wild. Standing over four feet tall, larger than a vulture, the bustard is one of India's most impressive birds. But illegal hunting, combined with the spread of farming into their dry land habitats, is now seriously threatening their survival, despite the hunting of this bird being officially banned in 1977. The bustard was a favorite prey of the ancient Rajput kings and the Maharajas who succeeded them. And this part of Rajasthan contains some of the most impressive forts and palaces in India. Important trading centers on the ancient camel caravan routes across the desert. The old town centers are inside the massive fortified walls. Maharajas built fabulous palaces within their fortifications, often with sophisticated water systems, like the complex network of Rajput wells and tanks at Jodhpur. As always, water attracts life. Beside an ancient reservoir, a colony of fruit bats rest up during the heat of the day. Nearby, a flock of demoiselle cranes, one of the smallest of the crane species. Known locally as kunj, they have been extensively hunted for centuries and were regarded as a delicacy by the Mughals and Maharajas. Nevertheless, numbers are still high, with many thousands arriving here from Central Asia each October. Roosting on the shady walls of the ancient fort, a mass of vultures who survive by scavenging on the town below. Soaring high on the thermals, they use their keen eyesight to scan the landscape, occasionally diving down to feed on the waste of human activity. A close relative of the horse and African zebra, the Indian wild ass was hunted by both the Mughals and the Maharajas for no other reason but sport as the flesh and the hide are of no use at all. <coughs> Once widespread in the dryland areas, the wild ass is now confined to the salt flats of southwest Gujarat. As well as hunting, disease also struck earlier this century, reducing the population to just a few hundred, and the species is perilously close to extinction. But here, as in all of India, the survival of wildlife is endangered increasingly from another direction, the spread of human activity, especially cultivation and grazing. The same combination of hunting and farming is threatening one of Hinduism's most holy creatures, the black buck, or sacred antelope. The Mughals used to hunt them with cheetahs, as did the local Maharajas, until the cheetah became extinct in the 1940s. Only the males are black, the females and juveniles being a golden brown. One of the world's fastest herbivores, the black buck can run at 50 to 60 miles per hour, 
often jumping in great leaps to avoid predators. Once extremely common throughout India, it's now only found in small pockets in the dryland areas, like Velavada, a former Maharaja's hunting reserve, where the black buck was preserved for shikar. Raja's passion for hunting, combined with that of the British, undoubtedly contributed to the decline of many of wild India's major species, like the tiger, the black buck, and the Asiatic lion. But like the Mughals, the Maharajas, paradoxically, very often had a love of nature and were passionate conservationists. To many, the sport of hunting went hand in hand with the preservation of game. Well, in the olden days, of course, you know, the Maharajas or the rulers had, uh, were the rulers of the state, and they had the preservation of wildlife very much at their heart, and uh, they saw to it that it was well preserved. I would say the Maharajas did. The princely states uh, even today, it's, most of the game would be in the old princely states, because it was very really looked after. But they looked after the game for their own benefit. Uh, they wanted to enjoy hunting, but they knew and if they didn't care for what they had, then they wouldn't have any hunting. In the dry, dusty south of Gujarat, in the west of India, one Maharaja played a particularly significant role in saving one of India's most endangered species. For the Gir forest contains the last population of an animal that was once feared and revered throughout Asia. The Asiatic lion is similar to its African cousin in size and appearance. It was once found right across Asia Minor and Central Asia, from the Holy Land to India. Today, the once wide-ranging Asiatic lion is confined to this small forest in western India, and there are only around 200 left. That they have survived at all was because of the action of the local Maharaja, the Nawab of Junagar, who banned hunting here at the turn of the century, when he realized that the British officers and aristocracy were hunting the lion to extinction, numbers having plummeted to a mere 20 animals. Thanks to the Nawab's protection, the lion came back from the brink of extinction, a fate that had already befallen the cheetah. And eventually, in 1950, the Gear Forest was declared a national park. Now though, like many of India's nature reserves, Gear is under pressure from human encroachment especially the spread of agriculture. Throughout the park, in thorn-fenced enclosures, live the Maldaris, a tribal people who survive by selling milk from their buffaloes and curd made in the traditional way. Life has changed little here over the years, and the Maldharis' folklore and traditions are a unique record of coexistence of human beings with lions. <coughs> but today, this ecological balance has been disrupted, as the cattle population grazing every day in the park is now in excess of 20,000 animals. And this huge, semi-permanent animal population has become a substantial and vital part of the lion's diet.
Not a day passes without a lion taking a buffalo from the Maldari's herds. And over a thousand are killed every year, leading to disputes over compensation and even cases of lion poisoning. What's making it worse is the tendency for other natural prey species, like the Nilgai, to be pushed out by competition for grazing from the buffalo and by habitat disturbance from humans, making the lions even more dependent on the domesticated herds. The largest and most powerful of India's antelopes, there's a marked difference in this elegant species between the male, or blue bull, and the smaller golden-brown females. Guaranteeing the survival of the Asiatic lion is now a top priority in government wildlife circles. For at any time, a disease, perhaps emanating from the buffalo population, could easily wipe out a species so close to extinction. A major rescue effort has now been started, which involves moving the Maldaris and their buffalo away from the park into development zones, and at the same time upgrading the core area of the reserve ecologically, allowing in particular natural prey species to return. As with so many of India's large mammals, it was hunting that caused a rapid decline in lion numbers, and the spread of farming and the growth in population also drastically reduced its domain. But if it hadn't been for a hunter, a Maharaja turned conservationist, not even this small and fragile population would exist today, and the king of beasts, feared and revered throughout the land, would be no more. By the 1920s, it was obvious to Maharajas and British alike that hunting was taking its toll on wild India. Ironically, this itself attracted big game hunters from all over the world, anxious to bag a tiger, lion or rhino before it was too late. Towards the last days of the Raj, there was a growing concern in British circles about the way in which the wildlife of the country they had ruled for 200 years was disappearing. In places like the hill station, Uti, in the Nilgiri Hills in South India, the shooting of wildlife had been brought under control back in the 1870s, when the Nilgiri Wildlife Association was formed by local residents. In the 1920s and 30s, when the huge extent of species depletion was realized, the association became a powerful conservation lobby which kept all local hunting under strict control. Its prime movement was conservation of game and it was very strictly controlled. And the association looked after it and had definite powers in the issuing of licenses, cancelling of licenses, fines, and in the general control of all shooting. You take fishing in England. Uh, people look after the rivers. They look after them to catch the fish. Now, uh, I may have been a hunter. I would be a hunter today. But naturally, one which uh, would be conditioned according to the game which is present. I mean, I wouldn't think of shooting a tiger. But I would think of shooting a tiger 40, 50 years ago, which I did. 
uh, but they're very scarce now. We have to cull game. And if there is a certain amount of uh, hunting allowed and properly controlled, there's an interest in the preservation of it. Once that is removed, it becomes a poacher's paradise. The most famous of the British hunter conservationists was Jim Corbett, who became renowned for his feats in slaying man-eating tigers and leopards. But Corbett always had a love of Indian wildlife and realized that the tiger and many other species were becoming endangered. In his later years, he hung up his guns and became a writer, photographer, and passionate conservationist with a special place in the history of wild India. Corbett lived in the foothills of the Himalayas, where he became a legend with the local people for his bravery in slaying the man-eaters. But it was here also, in the misty valley of the Ramganga River, that Corbett helped to establish in 1936 India's first and arguably most beautiful national park, famous for its elephants. Originally called Haley Park, after a British governor, it was renamed Corbett Park in 1952, in honor of the great hunter-turned-conservationist who had pushed for its formation and helped to demarcate its boundaries. Today it's part of the Project Tiger Initiative, and one of the most visited parks in India, with a huge variety of species to be seen. Unlike many of India's nature reserves, Corbett Park was never a hunting reserve, but it was the commitment of a hunter-turned-conservationist that helped to bring it into being. It is not without irony, but nevertheless true, that the main reason why India's extraordinary wildlife has survived to the present day is because of hunting. For without the protection of the sporting classes, today's nature reserves would almost certainly not exist. The moguls showed that the sport of kings was not incompatible with a love for nature, and many of the Maharajas and British shared this same double passion, eventually discarding their guns in the cause of conservation. The question now, is whether the state can be as effective in protecting these pockets of wild India as the princely rulers were in the past. Or whether the rising tide of human activity will eventually sweep even these last vital islands of wildlife away. <laughs> 